Greetings, Kasich comrades. This is All Things Chess with Cybertail. I am Cybertail. I've got my Homestar hoodie on. It is a cold, rainy day here in Mishawaki, Indiana. And other than cuddle sex, I can't imagine anything else I'd want to be doing than playing some chess right now. Um, we're continuing our examination of isolated pawns. Uh, we're continuing with some classics. We're looking at a game of Jose Raul Capablancas today. He was playing Richard Teichman, who was actually a pretty decent player back in the 1910s and 1920s. Um, this was an exhibition match, which I'm not really sure what that meant back in the day. A match is sort of a match. Um, certainly wasn't for a world title. This is in 1913, so this is long before uh, Capablanca won the world title. Uh, he won San Sebastian in 1911, which is sort of his debut tournament. So here, Capablanca was already recognized as one of the top players in the world, but he hadn't managed to get his way into a match for the world title with Lasker just yet. Um, but Capablanca was white here. D4, D5, F6, Bishop G5. Again, this is sort of a, a interesting move order from White that allows Black a few more possibilities. Knight C3 is a little bit more restrictive. I would say it's the safest choice if you want to be guaranteed to get your Queen Gamma decline position. Uh, problem Bishop G5. I mentioned this in the last video, but Dx C4 is actually possible here, and then B5. Uh, th this isn't necessarily bad for white. I would say this is still a perfectly fine position, but it's a very double-edged position, and it's nothing like the typical cow-milking technical position that you usually get with a queen's game declined. So if you're looking to be guaranteed of a uh, technical queen's gambit position, I would say knight c3 is a preferable move order. But in most situations, the move order doesn't matter. We just go for the straight queen's game decline stuff. So castle. This is a standard position here where everything branches from. Uh, rook c1. So this is the other... There are three main moves here. There's rook c1, there's queen c2, and then there, there's the move that I really don't like that I've mentioned in every other video, the bishop d3, that I just don't really care for. Uh, rook c1 is okay. Um, it keeps the light square bishop at home, so you're fighting for that dx c4 tempo. You're not losing that tempo immediately. Uh, and you're keeping the queen at home, which potentially... Uh, protects you from losing time in certain positions. The downside is, uh, if the C file never opens, that rook could just be misplaced. So, like most things in chess, it is a trade-off. Um, I still prefer queen c2, but if queen c2 weren't available, rook c1 would be my next choice. Uh, so rook c1, b6. So this is instantly inaccurate. This makes the rook on c1 uh, look fully justified. Um, the most common move here is c6, and this is truly the main line. Then bishop d3, and then white, uh, black takes on c4, and knight d5. And this is actually a relieving maneuver invented by Capablanca. Um, and this has been seen in uh, thousands of contests. Uh, black is a little bit worse, for sure. I mean, that light square bishop on c8 is truly uh, a sad sight. And we're going to be liquidating down to a position where it's one of the few minor pieces that black has left. But it's a very solid position for black. Um, but b6 certainly is inaccurate. Um, Capablanca plays c6, d5. This is a very accurate play, so it doesn't allow black to shore up his position all. It immediately opens the c file, so it makes that rook and c1 fully justified. So that's excellent play by Capablanca. Ex d5, just to point out, knight xd5 isn't possible because of the rook and c1. And White simply up the pawn, he'll convert that pretty easily. Uh, so ex d5, bishop b5, not the most popular from this position. Even after b6, this position has been seen hundreds of times. Um, but this is logical enough. Uh, bishop b5 immediately fights for the weakened light squares on the queen side. Um, bishop d3 is the most popular, just an aside. It's probably the strongest. Um, but bishop b5 was a favorite of couple blockers. Uh, also, queen a4 is a move that was seen in a lot, a lot of contests. Uh, this was seen in a Capablanca Lasker game from their 1921 match. Um, in that, just in a quick aside, in that particular match, um, Lasker chose to sacrifice a pawn. Just as an aside. But um, this is uh, long before that match, so uh, Capablanca hadn't played that uh, Queen A4 move yet. So Bishop B5, Bishop B7, Castle... A6, bishop a4. So this is sort of teasing uh, the black b-pawn forward. Um, but what if that b-pawn push is actually not so bad? So uh, black played rook c8, which is 
natural, but I think b5 is perfectly fine, actually. So bishop c2, c5. And this is sort of a, a this is a different sort of isolated queen pawn setup that you see uh, sometimes. With all the queen uh, isolated queen pawn positions you've seen so far, it was very kingside attack centric. You know, the this bishop would be on this diagonal, this bishop would be on d6 to aim at the king side. Both these knights would be swarming to the king side. Uh, here it's a little bit more queen side oriented. So black has his pawns in a6 and b5, which sort of helps generate queen side play uh, further down the road. Um, his bishop is on b7, which adds some stability to his d-pawn. So that makes it a little bit harder for uh, white to generate play against that uh, isolated pawn. Uh, the bishop is on e7, so that makes it a king side play a little bit less plausible. So in this particular isolated queen pawn setup, you're actually a little bit more likely for uh, black to be playing on the queen side. Um, he might be able to play his pawn to b4 and generate some uh, initiative on the queen side. He'll occupy the e4 square because both his knights are aiming at that square, plus the bishop on b7 is helping reinforce this. Um, I would say this is just a normal isolated queen pawn. I think white's a little bit better, but that's just personal preference. Um, I think this is a, a perfectly good fight from here. This is a completely normal position. So I actually think b5 is a little bit more uh, preferable than rook c8. Because um, we don't really know. The rook on c8 will probably be useful, but we're not exactly sure. And you want to play the moves that you know 100% are, are going to be useful before you get uh, to the other moves. So rook c8. Queen e2, not the best. This queen on e2 isn't necessarily accomplishing anything. I think h3 is a, it's a decent little improving move that asks black to find a move in the meantime. Um, but queen e2 is a small error, but not worth shaking. C5, uh, dx c5, knight c5. So this position, this is a common uh, quandary that comes up frequently in these positions, whether to take on the isolated pawn or to take on the hanging pawns. Um, in my opinion, it's better here to take on the hanging pawns. Um, this bishop on b7 would be really well served if you can achieve d4. In this position, you're never achieving d4. That bishop's just always going to be bad. In the hanging pawns position, this bishop is actually pretty well placed because it helps. Uh, d4 will help unmask that piece and help support that d pawn. Um, plus, white's pieces really aren't terribly well set up to face the hanging pawns. Typically, you'd want at least one or both of these bishops fee and shadowed to help bombard these hanging pawns. Uh, both these bishops are just sort of hanging out on the sides there. They're not really aimed at the hanging pawns at all. Um, and these hanging pawns help take up a, a nice chunk of central space. So I think here, actually, this is more or less an equal position, just a quick line I gave. And this is pretty well balanced. I think it's hard for either side to really accomplish too much. If you uh, put a bowl of spaghetti to my head, I would take black just because I like playing with hanging pawns, but that's just personal preference. This is completely balanced. After knight xc5, I think this is a little bit better for white, just because it is an isolated pawn, and that bishop on b7 really isn't a great piece at all. But rook fd1, knight xa4. This is a, So typically I'm all for trading knights for bishops, um, but when you have an isolated queen pawn, this is exactly what you don't want to do. You don't want to be trading minor pieces. You want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. Uh, simply, black should just play h6, and then b5. Um, let's say he drops back to c2. Then you can even continue with b4 and get a queenside initiative going. And I would say this is a decent position for black. I think white's a little bit better, but nothing too serious. Um, but not xa4 is exactly what you don't want to do with an isolated pawn. You want to keep those minor pieces on the board. Not xa4. b5. This is the wrong timing. Uh, better would be h6. And this is slightly worse for black, um, but it's still a fight. The problem with b5, and it's surprising that Capablanca missed this opportunity. Um, you associate Capablanca with just sheer machine-like accuracy. Uh, he played rook xc8, which um, this is this misses a pretty simple intermezzo. He should just take an f6. Um, black has two choices here. Well, three choices. If he takes an f, if he just takes an f6, then just knight c5. 
Um, and both those knights have very na natural squares to move to. Um, yeah, there's not even really a great space for the queen. It looks like queen e7. Uh, and then b4. Uh, this is a crushing position for white. Both these knights have very natural outpost squares to go to. This one has c5. It just rules the world from that outpost. And the other knight has d4, which is a natural outpost anyways. Um, the bishop pair is really... It's not really relevant here because that bishop on b7 is so poor. Um, white or Black could take an a4, but this leaves Black's position a complete shambles. And then the third option, trading on c1 first, just leaves the same sort of position. Both those knights are just going to uh, wear Black's position down. Those are incredibly well-placed pieces. So it's strange that Capablanca missed that trick because it's a fairly simple uh, in-between move. Uh, but in the game, actually, I actually think black is a slightly better position. Knight c3, queen c4, probably not the best, probably h6 is better. Bishop takes, and this is, this is just one potential line. Queen c1, and black gets his pawn back. Uh, he's going to take back on b2 with the queen. Um, more or less, black is going to have the slightly more comfy side of the draw. Uh, but if anyone's going to win, it's going to be black, just because he has the queen side. Or, let's get pieces on the board. Let's get that position on the board. So, um, this is probably going to end up a draw. This is still pretty equal, but the on only person that can really win is Black. Uh, he's got the outside queen side majority favorism. He has bishop versus knight, which is absolutely a huge edge because that bishop uh, can control both sides of the board at once and move much faster than the knight can. Um, so. Black's a little bit better, but it should still be well within the drawing margin. But black can certainly do from, some work from there. But queen c4 isn't disastrous. Knight d4. Now queen x8 2 that is disastrous. When you have an isolated pawn, you don't want to be trading pieces, especially your queen. Once you trade, especially your queen off, that saps your position of a lot of its dynamism, and it's hard to really do anything. Um, this is just voluntary positional suicide for a black. Um, one better line I give, just one example h6, uh, 9 f5. This is an example of a cute little tricky line, but black is doing perfectly fine. hg. And th this is perfectly manageable for black. Um, the d-pawn is a, a form of weakness, of course, um, but the material is so reduced that it's hard for white to really organize a full attack against it. Um... And that's the weird balance of playing against the isolated pawn, is that you want to reduce material, but you don't want to deduce it, reduce it too much, because then it's actually hard to win the pawn. Um, but black can also organize some nice queenside play here. You can get b4 in and chase that knight away, which reduces the pressure uh, on his uh, d5 pawn. Um, also, g4 in some places can help crowd the black king or white king side, and black can get a little bit of an initiative over there. So. Um, black should be fine in this position, but queen xe2 is simply wrong. You don't want to be trading queens with an isolani. Uh, rook c8, fighting for the file. Um, but this, this it's strange, because this position has very specific tactical problems to it, all because of that bishop on g7. Um, just to uh, give another example, let's say, so in the game, white immediately takes possession of the f5 square. And when I was pre uh, preparing my notes for this game, like, okay, well, what if we take possession of the g6 square immediately? Um, then I found this line where it basically just turns into the game all over again. So rook c1, uh, taking possession of the c-file, black has to challenge or he's dead. And knight c6, and we're more or less getting the exact same position. Uh, the bishop's attacked, so the king has to guard it. And after, after the simple move f3, this pin on the knight, f, uh, knight on f6 is completely mortal. There's no way for black to escape this. Um, black has one other move, it's king e6, and then just knight d4. And king f2, and sort of in the spirit of uh, short teaman, uh, the king is just going to march all the way to e5, and then win the knight on f, uh, f6. And there's nothing in the world that black can do about it, except to just dump the pawn to escape the pin. Really a, a remarkable position. You rarely see that sort of durable and mortal pin, uh, but it is decisive here. So rook c8, knight f5. We're basically just leading to the exact same concept here. Knight d4, g6. This is 
a serious mistake because it leads to more or less the same position as we just looked at. Uh, King d7, he has to escape the pin. Uh, this leads to a truly horrifying position for black. He has no pawn structure left. But at least here, material is still equal. He still owns the c-file, um, and black st or white still has to find the moves to make this work. You know, it's not going to be a gimme. He has to execute properly. It's, it's a technical win for white for sure, um, but stranger things have happened than white not winning a position like this. Uh, but g6 just turns a pin as we just looked at. So f3 from white. And again, it's just the same threat of king f2, king g3, king f4, king e5. Um, here, the fact that the pawn is isolated is almost, it sort of fades in the background because this pin on the f6 knight is the main feature of the position. Um, but even if this uh, knight pin weren't mortal for black, this would be very unfavorable. And this is more or less in the same spirit of uh, the floor position from two days ago uh, in the position we looked at yesterday. Um, White's getting exactly what he wants. He's reduced material, which is exactly what you want to do when you're fighting the Isolani. Um, the remaining bishop is Black's bad bishop, so it's not his good bishop. Um, I mean, one reason the pin, this pin is so mortal is because he doesn't have that bishop on the board anymore. Uh, but basically, the pieces left on the board all favor White, and that weakness on d5 has no compensation. There's no activity compensating. Um, but here, the main feature is the pin. Um, h6, he gives up a pawn to get out of it. Rook d8, maybe plenty of rook d6. But then just rook c1. And, uh, on, the king is going to march to e5, and then on uh, rook d6, just rook c7. But otherwise, white just owns the c file. This is a, a positional crush. So black just dumps the pawn. Knight d7. This is getting a little bit of feel from our isolated queen pawn study, but I'll still give some some comments from here on out. Uh, h4. This is called pushing the candidate. Um, the h. It, it's this is the extra pawn. The h pawn is unopposed on its file, so this is a pawn that's going to eventually queen. So that's pushing the candidate. That's a, con a concept from uh, Aaron Nimsovich. Knight c5. A6. I'm surprised Capablanca so confidently liquided down to an opposite color bishop ending. I mean, he is Capablanca, so his endgame technique is uh, pretty decent. Um, but I sort of think knight b3 might have been easier, because it keeps more material on the board. Uh, f6, if the knight takes, this is exactly what white wants. He's going to put his knight on d4, he's going to put his rook on d2, and then he's just going to push his kingside pawns. There's nothing black can do to stop any of that. Uh, f6... And th this looks easier to convert for white, because he still has a uh, knight on the board, so that can attack some light squares that the dark square bishop can't reach. So t Typically, with opposite color bishops, you don't want to reduce down the material too much, because it lead can lead to some technical draws. But a couple of Blanca goes for it. Rook c2. Uh, if black takes the pawn here, white gets it back. And continuing initiative and continuing attack, so black just goes back to c8. And I'm surprised Capablanca traded into this so uh, easily. Maybe you knew Black was just going to blunder right back. Um, so yeah, Black played d4 over here, which is just absurd. Um, if he holds, just hold serve here with bishop e6. Um, I mean, I don't think this... It might still be a win, but this isn't going to be easy for White. This is certainly a lot more complicated than it should have been you know, five or six moves ago. Um, or ten moves ago. Um, basically, black is just going to keep his king in the center here, so that if the white king goes over the queen side, the black king can cut the king off. Um, and then on h5, I'll just play a pass move for now. H5. Bishop f5, and then the, the pawn is pretty much halted. And, you know, it could still be a win for white, you know, it's certainly better for white, um, but this is a lot more complex than it, it should have been, you know, 10 moves ago. You know, 10 moves ago, white was just completely winning. This is this is no gimme. This is going to take some uh, accuracy, which combo block ahead in droves, but practically you want to make things easy for yourself, and trading now to an opposite color bishop ending isn't the easiest, just because these endings tend to be a lot more complex and tactical than otherwise. Um...
but black played d4, which is just an absurd move, because um, you sometimes sometimes do see this in uh, opposite colored bishop endings if it completely activates your bishop so it can guard both sides of the board. Here, this is going two pawns down, so let's, a little, it's a little bit different, and it doesn't give black's light square bishop access to both sides of the board at once. Like, if this were giving this bishop access to this whole long diagonal, say, theoretically, it might be worth it. Uh, but here, after ed, king d5, white's just two pawns up. Um, the pawn sacrifice hasn't activated black's pieces, and now the black king is tied down with the d-pawn. And white's just, white has a very simple plan here, which cover block executes. Bishop h6. And black resigned here, because the plan is very easy. Uh, the plan is just going to be king f4, g4, h5, and then queen. And there's no way for uh, Teichman to stop that at all. See, so he resigned here. Um, so, interesting game. Really, the, the key positional parts... This moment here, this is a key transitional moment that you see uh, in a lot of the, these sorts of positions, where you have to choose between transitioning to an IQP or transitioning to hanging pawns. Uh, here, black shows the hanging the isolated queen pawn, which in my opinion is a little bit weaker. Uh, but the main flaw is here, black decided to start trading minor pieces, which is just completely wrong. Uh, and in fact, white's mistake was not choosing not to continue to just trade. But once you're against the isolated queen pawn, you want to trade as many minor pieces as you can off the board uh, and keep as many major pieces as you can as you can on the board. Um, but yeah, really, the, the main thing you should take from this is, again, all the mistakes from black were trading pieces. When you have the isolated pawn, you don't want to trade pieces. When you go into an endgame with an isolated pawn, you need to have a very specific reason, like you're winning material, or you have some specific positional advantage you're gaining from it, if you're just going to an end game for the sake of it with an isolated pawn, you're probably just going to be worse, because then you have that weakness on d5 with no nothing to compensate for it. So, um, quick game, just to show another IQP end game. I think we're going to move on to other concepts with the next video. We're going to talk about defending against a kingside rush. I have a couple of games to show with that. Um, when you play against Ashley, uh, Queen Pawn, it's important to have good defensive technique because your king side will be attacked quite frequently. Um, so my name is John. I'll catch you later.